students probably ma maintain their virology labs a little more carefully if you've ever been to China. Yeah. Um, and and um, you know, there's this word in Chinese. Um, my daughter speaks Chinese, so she's going to yell at me for screwing this up on there. Chao with wool, which means um, good enough. <laughs> um, and so you're basically saying, okay, we're going to have this, you know, and that was one of the two things that happened in, in, in China. The other thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with the phenomenon of the Chinese paper mill. So in science, of course, which has been subjected to these kind of bureaucratic um, um, goals, your goal is to publish as many papers as possible. And so you do everything as you can do to publish high impact papers, as many as you can. That's how you succeed in science today. In China, it's even much more rigorous than that. It's like, you've got to get five high impact papers in this journal to be the head of your lab. It's like totally quantitative. And so you get um, a lot of production of basically low quality papers from China right. in a lot of different fields, including my field of computer science. Um, and so what you had was basically people going out, virologists going out, finding all the bat viruses they could, screwing around with them, in labs, in countries that all, everyone involved in this research had an incentive to exaggerate the danger of the research because they had to exaggerate the importance of the research. Of course. The more dangerous your virus is, the more important it is. So basically what you've done with virology by saying the virologists um, should run the show because decisions about what virology to study should be taken by virologists, naturally you're gonna get gain of function research. Because these virologists are basically in this like Darwinian cycle of exaggerating their own importance, and the more dangerous these viruses are, the more important they are. So and it's inevitable they will wind up creating viruses. Yeah, they they, they will actually wind up creating the virus that they are then literally hired to solve. Okay, so this is the case of Dr. Fauci, right? You know, and 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 so you know, you basically created this system of incentives. You know, to sort of step back a second and talk about how these oligarchies work. You know, but this is not a sustainable system that you're This is not a sustainable system, but it degrades slowly. And so what happens is this system was initially populated by these really wise and capable people, the Americans of the first half of the century. Can we say they were diverse? No, we cannot say that. But it was, you know, they were amazing people. They got shit done. They conquered the world. They were a big deal. They were the best and the brightest. They built the bomb, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Biggest engineering, you know, hey, libertarians, libertarians out there, biggest and best engineering project of the world, Manhattan Project. Yeah. Government project run like a startup. Um, and, and the government project run like a startup. How can you, you can't do that anywhere today, right? And so, you know, you're looking at this system of like, we're gonna delegate these decisions to these oligarchs these experts, these institutions, these prestigious things with the nice fonts and the black letter names that are super competitive and hard to get into. And what's happening is that you're sort of, you're feeding, there's this great Latin phrase, who will watch the watchdogs? I'd try Latin, but I don't really, I'd, I'd screw it up. Um, and, and then people would yell at me. And who should watch the watchmen? Right? And our answer is, oh, we're going to have this decentralized collective network of watchmen that we're going to funnel all of this toxic. We know that power corrupts. And so we're going to basically act like an early, well, the early Americans sucked at some things. And one of those things was environmentalism. And so they're we're going to basically say, you know what we're going to do with all our power pollution? We're basically going to just pipe it into this really big lake. And for a while, that worked. For a while, basically, you have this field of experts and you say, oh, we're going to take these like, intellectuals at these universities. The ideas of, of like, universities telling what the, government, the government what to do like, in 1900 is ridiculous. It's like a weird, they do that in Germany, right? Um, and, and now it's like assumed, like, my god, uh, no, how would you, like, the government would decide on its own. On it. Maybe the intelligence community does that sometimes. Uh, they don't seem to do a very good job of that. Um, you know, no, of course you ask Harvard. And what you're doing is you're basically, when you say, of course you ask Harvard, you're pumping power into these institutions. And what you don't realize is you're polluting them with power. And after a while, instead of getting this answer which people have disagreed on and fought over intellectually and been all philosophical about like the way you're imagining these things, you know, working, no, you're actually just being told what you wanted to hear. And so you have this whole system of 
who actually makes decisions, who actually makes calls. So before our, our hour ends here, um, let's get back to Afghanistan. So what a lot of the people out there in America don't really understand is they think they still have a World War II army out there. Just as they still think they have a World War II bureaucracy, World War II agencies. I mean, if you look right. at trust in these agencies, like public trust in these agencies, do I trust the government to do the right thing? You know, like 85% of Americans in like 1950 will say yes, of course. And the ones who don't are like communists, you know? And, yeah. and, 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 and this was the level of trust under which the world was conquered and, you know, like, all of these interstates were built. This is a lost and forgotten era. And you know, today, of course, people look at the, like, they look at the Congress, like you know, uh, one thing that I, I like to observe that breaks people's brains, but no one can disagree with. If you look at the executive branch, it's really the legislative branch. It's managed by Congress, not by the White House. This is why when you elect a president, the wires of power basically go nowhere. He can't reorganize these agencies. He can't tell them what to do. You know, there are no, no, Congress never goes and testifies, you know, agencies never go and testify at the White House. Um, Congress micromanages them completely through what are called laws. Um, and so you're looking at this, this crazy thing in reality and there is no accountability. There are sort of no incentives. It's like if you ran like a, you know, a car factory for like 50 years and you ran it in Soviet style and it had weird production quotas and things and it didn't matter what people thought of the cars. So, you know, what most people don't know is that this has affected DOD as well. This is not just a civilian thing. This has affected both sides of Washington, red Washington as well as blue Washington. Well, I think we've and, all discovered that. So I yeah. just gotta ask you, you're describing uh, a system that destroys itself. Yes. Um, it degrades over time. That's right. Yeah. And, but that degradation seems to be accelerating. I, I, that's a hard thing to say. It's, 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 a, it's a really hard thing well, to assess. Well, how long does this last and what is it replaced by? Oh, um, I think it can go, uh, you know, completely indefinitely. I mean, it, it basically just gets worse and worse. Uh, you know, it, people always ask me, you know, there's a sort of trope in conservatism to always think you're at a turning point. Right. I think there's an, there's an organization called that or something. Um, and, you know, there's this constant, if you read old, go back and read, like, you know, the National Review from like 1982 or something, you know, it's always a turning point. Uh, it's always, do we go this way or that way and send money now, right? And, and <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, you know, you should send money at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna be doing that. Uh, um, and and um, um, televangelism, I mean, it works. <laughs> and and um, 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 all right, send, send it to me, subscribe to, subscribe to my newsletter, which you can find at Gray Mirror with an A at substack.com. Um, and so, you know, there's this, when, when you ask what comes now, there's this sort of, the reason I take issue, the reason I'm busting your balls over this, Tucker, is that when you ask what comes now, there's a sense of helpless automatism there. And you're like, okay, well, you know, History has these big cycles and moves in these big waves and, you know, what's coming along sort of next for us. And it, this is what's called the Whig theory of history, yes. um, you know, which is, the, well, the Whig theory of history, that's Whig with an H, uh, is that there's a sort of relentless progress of history. And then it always thinks, keep always getting, getting, getting better and better. And I'm like, you know, that's funny. When I look, look at pictures of this place from like 50 years ago and now, it actually like doesn't seem to be getting better. Like it seems to actually be getting worse. Much worse. And and you know there are all these people in Silicon Valley who are like studying like you know progress. I'm like, well, progress is great. Let's let's worry about like not regressing first, shall we? Yeah. Um, and yeah. and and you just see all of you know the evidence of decline that you see when you look for it. Just the physical evidence, like yes. driving through I'm America. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Driving through America. You know, it's like um um. How much time do we have left? Do we have? How much time are we in? I think we're about an hour in. We're about an hour in. Uh, you know, I was, I was uh, you know, okay, decline everywhere, et cetera. You're the only person I've ever <laughs> interviewed on this show where I said, no, we only have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the op automatism of, oh, you know, this system is just, you know, is bound to collapse or something. No, there's no way in which it's bound to collapse. And, uh, the, and it's very easy to look at what the future is. It's called the third world. You can go there, you can see pictures of it. Everything is just gonna continue to get more and more third world indefinitely until in like 100 years or so, you're basically at Venezuela, or maybe 50 years, I don't know. But that's, that's the, you know, that's sort of the default future that you're on. 
let me give you the other future that, because I know we're out of time, that I think we're on, which is one of the things, uh, it's interesting, I was uh, recently called out with uh, by uh, the, um, can I say this word on the air, the one that starts with a C? I was recently called out by the people at the Bulwark or something for being friends with Mike Anton, uh, the, the Flight 93 guy. And uh, I like Mike Anton. Yeah, I love Mike Anton. He's he's awesome. Uh, didn't did you, did you have him on here? Recently? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Mike Anton is amazing, right? And and you we know we want to keep the discourse alive. And and, on and, and 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 they're like, my God, you're friends with this Curtis Yarvin person, right? And uh, Curtis Yarvin has this strange, you know, theory. And then they went through uh, sort of uh, caricatures, not actually terribly inaccurate character caricatures of uh, my perspective. And one of the things that they mentioned, which I happen to believe is true. If you look at American history the way people read French history, uh, which is they number the republics. So I think they're yeah. officially on their fifth republic. Uh, I might call it the sixth, um, you know, uh, at, at present. Um, this is also the way America works. So actually, we're on about our fourth republic here in America because the fund, of, first of all, you have a complete change of constitutional document in 1789 with the Constitution, which is really basically a right-wing monarchical coup that results in what is essentially the Hamilton administration. Yep. And so what you have at the start of you know, American history, the USG, this thing in Washington, is Alexander Hamilton basically being the CEO of the United States government. And even though he's nominally just the Secretary of the Treasury, he's basically running everything, and Washington is running political interference for him. So you have this system which is actually, it works a lot like a monarchy which is like a company, like a startup. It's like, you know, do you drive a car? Your car was made by a monarchy. Uh, do you go to a restaurant? Your restaurant is a monarchy. Um, every functional, you know, institution in the world has this, you know, very simple pyramid structure. So at the beginning of this era, kind of the second American Republic, the first being the, the Congress of the Convention, which is just a complete shit show, and has actually been really airbrushed out of history. Like, you don't even know the, the names of the politicians involved in that shit show. Um, you know, there's just always this, like, who was the first president question that, yeah. you know, is the, like the president of the Congress. Um, and I think people even disagree on that. You know, like, it's this complete mess. And out of this mess, basically... Hamilton is like, I'm going to create a government. I'm going to create what is essentially a sovereign company that is in charge of all of these states that acts like a government that has, that does government like financial things and foreign relation things. And he wanted to do a lot of trade restriction, which unfortunately he didn't get to, but later that, that became adopted in the so-called American system. And, um, you know, he created this monarchy. Right, but of course, you know, he goes out in this stupid duel. Yeah. Um, and the system degrades, it basically falls apart and it becomes more and more oligarchic. There's a lot of ways of doing oligarchy. You can have oligarchies of wealth, you can have oligarchies of violence, uh, you know, the, the sort of you know, institutional test-based oligarchy that we have now, which is so freaking strange, is sort of only one of many ways to do this. Um, and um, you sort of get this kind of, uh, ossif kind of benign ossification of the U.S. government right up to the Civil War. And, in, in, you know, in the Civil War, you have this very small kind of out-of-touch government. And again, it becomes completely revolutionized by America's Third Republic, in which basically the Constitution has a different meaning, or rather resolves an ambiguity in the original meaning. And once again, you find one individual completely in charge of the government. Yes. Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln is mainly kind of an intuitive po you know, politician. And look who's actually in charge of the government, uh, John Hay, um, and God, what's his first name? Hay and Nicolay. Um, and they're startup kids. They're kids just like all the founders you'll find running around San Francisco. Here's this couple of incredibly smart you know, kids with patrician backgrounds who are in their 20s, and they're just like, we're going to create a government. We're going to do it. We're going to found this thing. It's like starting Uber. And, and, and that was basically the third American Republic was a kind of new generation of sort of monarchically organized civil service that starts with these people. Then again, you have another revolution in the form of FDR. 
So FDR comes in and this thing has become tremendously ossified and full right. of these old corrupt politicians and hidebound and bureaucratic and small and just has not adapted to this itself to this new way of government by intellectual. And FDR is, is fine. That's fine. We're just going to come in. FDR could, you know, he had some trouble with some of the older line agencies. He liked to create new agencies. He could create agencies. He could destroy agencies. You know, no one can do that shit in Washington now. No one has that kind of power. And so, you know, are there limits? He has a, basically a rubber stamp Congress. Um, he makes this incredible, uh, you know, I do.